The information shared here is for educational purposes and not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Consult your physician for any medical issues you may be having. Under methylation myths, MTHFR, and folate. In case you haven't met methylation, it's an important biochemical process in which methyl is added to particular molecules. Our ability to methylate impacts the expression of our genes, our ability to detoxify, and our vulnerability to inflammation. A methylation imbalance can contribute to chronic health issues like cardiovascular disease, autoimmunity, cancer, and psychiatric conditions. 70% of those with a psychiatric condition have a methylation imbalance, and most of those individuals will be under-methylated. So symptoms and traits to remind you of under-methylation, and I do have a previous podcast where I talk about this in more detail, but under-methylation traits include perfectionism, being strong-willed, competitive, having a calm demeanor with high inner tension, being prone to being ritualistic, having dietary inflexibility, being prone to depression, obsessive-compulsive tendencies, addictive tendencies, seasonal allergies, and having a family history of high accomplishment or a personal history of high accomplishment. So the incidence of undermethylation to explain how prevalent it is with particular conditions, in autism it's 98%, antisocial personality, 95%, schizoaffective disorder, it's 90%, Oppositional defiant disorder, 85% are undermethylated, anorexia, 82%, and depression, 50%. It is the most common biochemical imbalance when it comes to depression. MTHFR, or methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, is considered the most important enzyme in the process of methylation. A variation on the gene for this enzyme could mean a less effective enzyme and thus impact methylation. The most commonly prescribed supplements for those with an MTHFR variant is folate. So myth number one, having a variant on the MTHFR gene is unusual. It is estimated that 30 to 40 percent of the American population have a variant at position C677T of this gene, so it's not necessarily that unusual. Myth number two, Having an MTHFR variant means you are undermethylated. As the star player in methylation, MTHFR gets a lot of attention, but there are other genes which can also have variants that decrease or de increase methylation and can even offset the impact of MTHFR. Separately, having a variant doesn't mean that a gene won't do its job. Trauma, toxicity, chronic stress, and or our microbiome can impact genetic expression, and thus methylation, and thus the expression of other genes. As you can see, this gets complicated. Those of us trained through the Walsh Research Institute assess methylation with a whole blood histamine, methylation breaks down histamine, or we use a methylation panel because certain medications can lower that whole blood histamine. But more importantly, we look closely at symptoms and traits. Myth number three, everyone who has an MTHFR variant needs folate. While folate helps a methylation cycle, which is fabulous, it also can unfortunately lower serotonin activity by way of an epigenetic mechanism. To oversimplify, folate impacts how tightly wound DNA is which impacts the expression of certain genes. One of those genes encodes for serotonin reuptake receptors. So these are receptors at the synapse, the space between two nerve cells, and they're receptors that will reuptake serotonin from that space. And the more there are, the less serotonin there can be in that space. Dr. William Walsh, a pioneer in the field of methylation and brain disorders, found that most individuals with undermethylation and brain symptoms had excess folate. Folate, for someone already low in serotonin, could further decrease serotonin 
and thus worsen depression and anxiety. Endermethylation, from this perspective, is a methyl folate imbalance, too little methyl and too much folate. Overmethylation is the reverse. This does run counter to the practice of many conventionally trained psychiatrists who give folate, usually in high doses, to those with an MTHFR variant on gene site testing. Similarly, many functional medicine doctors or practitioners use folate in those with MTHFR variants independent of low serotonin symptoms such as depression. All this to say, this impact of folate on low serotonin activity is not well known. Myth number four, those with low serotonin under methylation should never have folate. If someone has a high homocysteine, we might use folate briefly to bring it down. This often isn't necessary, however, as we have other tools such as B12, B6, serine, and TMG. If we have to use folate, we'll use it just long enough to bring homocysteine down before treating under methylation with targeted nutrients such as SAMe and or methionine, B6, magnesium, NAC is something I look forward to discussing in a future newsletter. Similarly, children with autism, though not necessarily those on the high functioning end of the spectrum, do seem to benefit from folate. Myth number five, multivitamins, including B-complex vitamins, are good for everyone. Almost all multivitamins or B-complex vitamins contain some form of folate. Most of the adults and children I see in my practice are undermethylated with low serotonin symptoms. I am frequently taking people off multivitamins. Again, what I'm talking about is related to those with undermethylation and low serotonin symptoms. Myth number six, everyone should eat a lot of leafy greens. A diet high in folate for someone with low serotonin under methylation and thus likely having too much folate already isn't necessarily a good thing. I have seen a number of undermethylated people who because of their undermethylated traits, their being strong-willed and having restricted eating patterns were able to sustain a strict vegetarian diet that was low in protein and thus low in methyl, which was making them more depressed and or feeling more machine-like, being excessively disciplined and lacking enjoyment. Spinach, asparagus, and Brussels sprouts are also high. Avocado is up there too. Myth number seven, cereal is the breakfast of champions. Most cereals, healthy ones included, are fortified with folic acid. For those of us with undermethylation, fortified cereals can worsen symptoms. Aside from cereals, many bread products, pastas, and sometimes rice is enriched with folic acid. This would be indicated on a label. Myth number eight, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I hope you're becoming aware that we all differ in our biochemical needs despite the dietary and supplemental recommendations out there. Myth number nine, if taking folate for the first three months of pregnancy is important, then taking it the entire pregnancy must be even better. The reason the first three months and prior if someone's anticipating pregnancy is to prevent neural tube defects, things like spina bifida. That's really important and recommended for all women, independent of methylation status. We don't know the methylation status of a fetus, but we do know that folate can impact the expression of certain genes. In 2016, research from Johns Hopkins was able to at least momentarily bring this concern to public attention. Quote, the researchers found that if a new mother has a very high level of folate, right after giving birth, more than four times what was considered adequate, the risk that her child would develop an autism spectrum disorder doubles, unquote. More for a low serotonin undermethylated mother, being on all that folate beyond that important first three months could be unnecessarily worsening or causing depression. 
And finally, myth number 10. Because the rate of variance takes generations to change, the incidence of undermethylation is relatively constant. In an upcoming newsletter, I'll share updates from the from Dr. Walsh and the Walsh Research Institute, including the finding of a significant increase in undermethylation and decrease in overmethylation in the population. I'll also discuss the role of NMDA receptor in methylation imbalances and how this too can be targeted with a specific nutrient. Thank you for listening and reading. If you're reading this in newsletter form, I welcome any comments on either my website or YouTube or on Substack where I'm just starting to share information. Until my next newsletter, take care. Bye-bye.